Okay, why don't we get started? Welcome everybody to this dissertation defense here today. I want to welcome all of you who are here in attendance today. My name is Helge Osterhold. I am a core faculty member of the East-West Psychology Department here at CIIS and had the honor to be the chair of this dissertation. Uh, the dissertation is titled Microdosing Psilocybin, a Narrative Inquiry by Sarah Willett. Uh, Sarah is a licensed clinical social worker and psychotherapist and our PhD candidate defending her uh, dissertation here today. I would also like to introduce the other committee members, uh, Dr. Rob Colbert, hi, uh, who earned a master's degree in transpersonal counseling from Naropa University in 2012 and 2018, a doctor of philosophy in anthropology and social change from CIIS. Dr. Colbert's research explored the experiences of adult couples who use MDMA recreationally and the perceived benefits of MDMA use on their relationships. Dr. Colbert is uh, also a uh, professional, licensed professional counselor and specialized in working with young adults. And I also want to introduce our second committee member, Dr. Sam Malcolmos, who is an interdisciplinary thinker and holistic counselor with a passionate interest in healing personal and collective trauma through a psychospiritual and integrative lens. He has published numerous articles in the field of somatic, humanistic and transpersonal psychologies and taught dozens of graduate courses in psychology and consciousness studies. So welcome to the committee. Welcome, Sarah, on your big day. What a journey uh, coming to this threshold here over these last few years. Uh, before I hand it over to Sarah and um, she will present to us, let me just tell you how this defense will uh, go here, a little bit about our agenda. So Sarah will present for somewhere between 45 and 60 minutes on her study. Um, then the committee will have some time to ask questions. We'll go around uh, twice and uh, committee members can ask a few questions, give feedback, um, probe on anything they uh, want to uh, hear a little bit more about, uh, critique in some ways that seem um, important or necessary. And then the committee, we will confer, we'll go to a separate breakout room to discuss our impressions of the defense and uh, any changes that still need to be made in the dissertation, any further critiques we have. And in that time, when we're conferring the audience members, you are all invited to also ask Sarah questions and be uh, joining the discussion. And then we come back and um, I'll report from our uh, discussion and our decision. Okay, um, that all being said, let's hand it over to Sarah and uh, for your presentation, Sarah. Please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, and thank everyone so much for coming. Really, really appreciate uh, your presence and support. Okay. So again, the title of my uh, dissertation is Microdosing Psilocybin, a Narrative Inquiry. And just a little, uh, some, some definitions. Uh, so microdosing is you know, within the context of hallucinogens and psychedelics is known as taking a sub hallucinogenic dose, which is 
generally a very small, in this case is a very small uh, dose of psilocybin that is within one tenth to one twentieth of the standard full, do full dose. Uh, and for the purposes of this study, when I was screening participants, I did ask for their kind of interpret their their definition of um, microdosing, and it did need to include you know uh, subtle effects or intended to be subtle and the ability to complete daily tasks. And I all also had a minimum study requirement, um, asking that everyone would have taken a, a dose on at least five occasions. And I did keep that number uh, small in order to uh, hopefully include anyone who, you know, perhaps had a neutral or negative experience. And so they, you know, didn't continue on to, you know, 20 doses or 30 doses. Um, wanted to acknowledge very much James Fadiman. He's uh, been referred to as the father of microdosing. Um, he's a longtime psychedelic researcher and is credited for the surge of interest in microdosing. Um, thank you, James Fadiman. And, um, interesting to note that there's there's no standardized definition or scientific consensus on what uh, microdosing um, as a practice means. There's it's it's still you know it's it's a it's pretty fluid construct. Um, uh, the I think the the core you know issue that a lot of people discuss is you know when understanding microdosing does it mean effects that are not at all immediately felt or you know, does microdosing sometimes been referred to as subperceptual? Does that subperceptual um, sort of uh, description include um, effects that are you know subtle but but are felt in the uh, immediacy? And what is psilocybin? Well, psilocybin, uh, you know, commonly referred to as magic mushrooms. It's uh, you know an interesting point that Paul Stamets makes is that of the you know hundreds of of species within each you know, species, you know, there's, you know, different strains. And then within each strain, there could be a tenfold or more range in psilocybin and psilocin from one collection to the next. And this is very important to keep in mind when, um, you know, when dosing, um, when figuring out a dose. Um, psilocybin is schedule one drug, uh, according to the Controlled Substances Act, you know, medical use or, you know, and it has a high potential for abuse. Um, and that's kind of, it's kind of paradoxical right now because it's also been granted um, breakthrough therapy status in 2018 um, by the FDA uh, to, to investigate its use in uh, major depression. It's also been used by past and current cultures, including Maya, Aztec, and the Mazatec for ceremonial healing purposes. And uh, in, again, in contrast to that, since 2018, psilocybin has become a patented drug um, formulated by biotech company uh, Compass Pathways as well as other, um, well, there are other uh, companies that have, have formulated by, I think Compass is the only one that's done the patent. So why study microdosing and in particular within the context of um, Western medicine? You know, I acknowledged that uh, this practice is, it's a practice that's taken up um, in lieu of or in addition to um, institutionalized um, medical, you know, options for wellness or enhancement, and you know, it's lacking right now in sort of safety regulations. It's also a practice that uh, does not, with discourses that are not centrally um, produced through the institutionalized uh, medicine. And uh, you know, when I first started this project. Uh, there was only one um, qualitative study on microdosing with reported benefits, um, including mood, benefits to mood, cognition, and creativity. Now there's, I think, upwards of 45 studies. It, you know, there were just another few that came out this, this, these past couple of months. Um, so it's a very understudied area of research. And you know, microdosing, it being a very different approach to the use of psychedelics, I think has a lot to add to the, the general field of um, psychedelic study for clinical um, re and research purposes. So just some observations, uh, again, acknowledging the, the way in which microdosing is, has not been, you know, fully established and defined by institutional practices. Just wanted to, you know, share that um, the DSM, which has been, you know, in some ways referred to as the Bible, you know, to kind of legitimize clinical knowledge uh, within the, you know, field of psychiatric medicine, you know, right now over 50 mental health organizations have 
petition for the DSM to be brought under independent scientific review um, based on concerns about the lack of scientific integrity and uh, safety. And then the National Institute of Mental Health withdrew its support from the DSM-5 uh, based on concerns about the validity of, of diagnostic categories. And um, this is, you know, in this is a little bit of background, uh, just and given that in my study, you'll be seeing that the participants in this study described a wide range of benefits um, with minimal side effects. Uh, so the research questions I used were, what is the experience of microdosing, psilo microdosing psilocybin like for individuals? And then what personal and cultural factors contribute to the choice to microdose? And again, I, you know, I wanted to ask pretty general questions because it's such an understudied uh, topic. Um, well, at least it, it certainly was when I started. Uh, the research design I chose was a qualitative method. Uh, qualitative, qualitative methods can be a great approach um, both for you know, getting a depth of, of understanding and information and they can be used to later on um, facilitate the, you know, the development of quantitative approaches. And I chose a narrative inquiry um, in part, you know, narrative you know, is a way of looking at the uh, kind of lived experience. And I was very curious about, you know, what is the lived experience of um, microdosing psilocybin? And narrative also uh, acknowledges the, is a way that, that can acknowledge the cultural and institutional narratives that, you know, go into um, informing a person's experience. I used semi-structured interviews, used a six-phase thematic analysis, and uh, what you see here to the right is an example of uh, one of the nine mind maps that I made. And all these little boxes are quotes. You don't need to really um, need to be able to read them, but they're all quotes that uh, came directly from the five participants. And I just essentially organized them around different themes, topics, and then distilled, distilled, and eventually came out um, with three themes. Um, that we'll be looking at today. And in addition, uh, this, this study also includes participant narratives, um, full kind of stories that, that were um, woven from the, the interviews. Here are some more mind maps, just examples. And the three themes we'll be looking at today from the study, uh, ambivalence towards Western medicine, adaptable and evolving over time, and wellness and support. And just wanted to introduce the five participants. I And just to note, I didn't do a, a, sp a separate demographic survey. So, you know, pretty much all the details uh, that are given here came through as they were telling stories of, you know, their, their experience with microdosing. So Paul's over 70. He's married to June. He has a background in science journalism. And he shows microdosing in the beginning uh, out of just general curiosity. And then June, uh, is in older adulthood, lives with Paul, and they both recently moved to Portugal um, after living in the United States for well over 20 years. And she works as a part-time caregiver and microdose for medicinal reasons. Thunder is in middle adulthood, graduate school, uh, lives in California, and uh, microdose to address uh, her use of Adderall. She really wanted to decrease, if not el eliminate the need for that. And she was also wanting to feel a sense of wholeness. And then Ariadne, also um, middle adulthood, she was transitioning out of self-employment um, at the time of our, our, our conversations. She lives in Colorado, is an artist, and she microdosed to address stress from the job transition. And she was also seeking, you know, connection to uh, what was important to her, you know, claiming, reclaiming what was, what was meaningful for her. And then Malia, 30 years old, uh, lives in Oregon, and she microdosed to treat major depression. So our first theme, ambivalence towards Western medicine. Uh, this is important to see how for, you know, for some, the ambivalence uh, directly informed the meaning that they made out of their experience and their choice. So all the, all the participants, when asked about their relationship with Western medicine, some described, you know, direct harm, others described uh, maybe having ethical issues or, you know, concerns about the, you know, financial, financial aspects of Western medicine, but uh, they, they also all described ways in which they, you know, felt supported 
in their in their health needs. Um, and again, this is this is a theme that's that's explored, um, acknowledging that you know microdosing is a choice that people are making in lieu of or in addition to. Uh, you know, maybe wellness practices that have a bit more, you know, regulation and um, are, you know, recognized um, as acceptable by, you know, Western medical institutions. So I'm going to first introduce Paul. And Paul, uh, again, chose microdosing out of general curiosity. He has a, he has a love of sort of the experimental process. Um, and so he, he says, you know, unlike some critics or many critics who have bone to pick with Western medicine, I'm very well aware of its merits and accomplishments. Um, but what he did have to say is that for him, Western medicine has no rational concept of health. It's got no way to finding health. And you see, and it sees, it sees, you know, patients is, humans is just patients, which is kind of profoundly absurd to my understanding. He says, I've been focused more on developing my own model of health. And what does that mean to me? When am I healthy? What does it feel like to be healthy? And he never really has looked to Western medicine to help him define that, that meaning for him. And we'll see how this comes in later and informs the meaning that he, you know, some of the meaning that he made of his, his experience. So next I'm gonna introduce uh, Thunder. And Thunder uh, shared that you know, in 2010, she had, or around 2010, she had gotten clean from a uh, opiate, using opiates for over 20 years, um, abusing, abusing them, she, she shared uh, for kind of to self-treat her, her social anxiety. She had been being prescribed them uh, for an injury, but you know, this was you know, years of uh, an experience working with addiction that um, she found, you know, painful, but also, you know, had learned a lot from, and she, she really came to microdosing wanting to, you know, both address wholeness and use of Adderall. She says, I've noticed that I can't feel my heart when I'm medicated on Adderall or opiates for that matter, which is my history. Well, I can focus uh, and, you know, it probably work more efficiently. I'm doing it without feeling my heart. I'm kind of depressed. I'm very disconnected. And she also says, you know, Western medicine, it served its purpose, but Western medicine didn't realize what it was giving me, if you will, or doing for me. I mean, I was using the medication. I wasn't using the medication for what they thought they were prescribing it for. And she also acknowledged, she says, you know, she, she was of the opinion that Western medicine is failing us on, on most levels. Uh, and then finally, I just want to talk a little bit about Malia. And Malia did express, you know, having some direct harm from uh, Western medicine, um, but also that she had learned to advocate for herself. She says, I definitely have some medical trauma, but I'm better at advocating for myself because of it. And she, you know, her, she decided to microdose to address uh, a pretty, you know, significant depression that she was going through. But she really deliberated between, you know, taking an antidepressants or try microdosing. And she came with a background of, you know, she, she did not have a, sort of a fond fondness for psilocybin. She'd had some uh, negative experiences and she'd also had a positive experience with antidepressants um, in her earlier years, but she was concerned about side effects and uh, it, not, it not working. Um, uh, so. Okay, just a little bit of, uh, background from uh, literature, a study by Webb on, um, it's a qualitative study on microdosing um, that was not limited to psilocybin. Um, almost none of these studies are. Um, she conducted a study and found that most microdosers preferred natural medicine over prescriptions. And that, that was the case for Malia as well. You know? uh, and then Lee found that people were primarily motivated to microdose to improve mental health, uh, personal growth, and 18% cognitive enhancement. And moving on, uh, we have the next theme, adaptable and evolving over time. And I'll be looking a little bit more at the, the two sub-themes, protocol, flexibility, and change, and evolution in meaning and choice. So the first sub-theme, uh, protocol, flexibility, and 
change. Um, the, the thing I want to note here is that microdosing, the, this, this overarching theme, you know, looked at how microdosing as a practice can be adapted and tailored to meet individual needs. Um, and so within this particular sub theme, we see how all participants were able to make decisions and adjustments to their microdosing protocol uh, that allowed them to adapt the practice to meet their needs. And, and in the next theme, we'll see how as participants made decisions based on their experience of microdosing, um, decisions on maybe dose adjustment, schedule variation, uh, within the case of Ariadne, concurrent use of other substances, uh, microdosing and psychotropic medication, that was you know, an aspect of the overall experience with Thunder and Ariadne, and the microdosing and full uh, dose psychedelics. Um, Thunder uh, wove a few full dose uh, doses of psilocybin um, throughout her overall experience of microdosing. She would take pauses um, in between those full doses, but that, that was a kind of a piece of her microdosing story. Um, so all these changes uh, affected the, the, you know, the, the meaning that people made of their experience. We're just gonna take a look at uh, dose adjustment in the current literature. And people are saying there's a need for experimentation to figure out what best dosage. And again, the, the Lee study found that 70% of respondents reported needing to make initial adjustments to their dose um, through trial and error. And we're going to look at June and uh, Paul and their dose adjustment. Um, just want to acknowledge that they both were also using um, Paul Stamets' recommendation to, to uh, add in lion's mane. Um, not, they also added in fish oil but, and the niacin and turmeric. Um, so this, this was sort of their, their microdosing protocol, so to speak. Um, and it's, they both found that at the higher dose, uh, positive effects, but the key finding here was that when their lifestyle changed, when they took on a massive building project, they found the need to, to lower the dose and found that that was supportive. Um, and they did find, you know, differing effects, uh, but just want to look at this dose change real quick. So at 0.22 grams, Paul says, it's enough to feel it and not enough that I have to stay indoors and have myself away, be cautious. Or I could, you know, I could even drive, you know, it's, it's not enough to disable me in any way. And it seems to be that this is maybe uh, the, just the right amount. And at that time it was, but again, when their, their lifestyle changed, um, they, they found that the 1.15 grams was very supportive. He says, absolutely no interruption or inhibition. And as a result of that, I've tended to just get on with the day. That's why I'm finding the productivity and the creativity and the it feels like feeling of on being on top of things. And, the, and Paul also, uh, as well as June, experimented with 0.11 grams. And it, you know, he, he couldn't feel any immediate effects. He did, you know, wonder if it was having, a, you know, positive effects, but he, he couldn't get a sense of that in his body. And then just wanted to share, you know, June, she, she, when she changed, she found that it was, you know, really quite different. It was quite interesting to discover um, that it was a bit easier and she could still, you know, feel the effects, but she could go about her business and do things in an easier way. So then just wanted to take a quick look at microdosing and psychotropic medication. This is one study, you know, again, an observational uh, quantitative study that was done um, and it, it did not limit to, you know, only microdosing psilocybin. So again, important to keep in mind, but found that 15.6% of respondents who stopped antidepressant medication stopped, uh, they stopped the medication, who, sorry, who used antidepressant medication stopped medication after the commencement of microdosing. And 39.7% who used other uh, psychotropic medications, they stopped after they, they had started microdosing. And then the 34.3% of those on antidepressants uh, continue their medication while microdosing. And so this is just, you know, based on kind of the findings of my study in conjunction you know, with this one, just supporting the need for a lot more research to understand, you know, what's, what's, what's really going on and, and you know, how, what's happening with, with people when they're microdosing and, and, and or, you know, stopping or, 
you know, kind of starting psychotropic medication, a lot more research needed. Um, okay. And I uh, want to acknowledge that three participant interviews uh, did, did explore their, their relationship to both psychotropic medication as they were describing their experience of, of microdosing. So then I want to take a look at this, this sub-theme, evolution in meaning and choice. And this sub theme is pretty significant. And um, I, I love this sub theme because for a long time, I thought it was just, I, it, to me, it just seemed quite logical. And I would even get a little embarrassed when I was sharing this with people. You know, I kind of turned my head and sort of, um, yeah, and the meaning changes. Um, but this is actually, you know, really significant because you, when really looking at it, you know, the meaning of the practice you know, it can evolve. And as the meaning evolves, the reason for choosing to microdose can change. And this can produce a cyclical effect that supports what is known as meaning response. Meaning response uh, in the literature, it's, it's understood as the powerful effect that subjective experience such as, you, you know, me, uh, meaning can have on biological therapeutic outcomes. And we're gonna take a look at how that showed up for some of the participants. Um, First, just want to talk a little bit about Paul, and you'll remember that Paul, he came to microdosing just out of general curiosity, didn't have a particular, you know, issue he wanted to address, and after changing his dose, he, he, and also, and finding that the, 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 the dose and, that, well, the, the protocol um, aided him in what he felt to be a reduced inflammation and decreased pain, which aided him in, um, uh, you know, being able to do a lot of physical activity, this is very meaningful for him. And he, he came to say, you know, he, he said, I don't feel any sense of side effects or physical disturbance or undesirable results or cumulative unpleasantness, absolutely nothing like that at all. So it's conceivable it may become a practice for the rest of my life. Um, and then let's, let's take a look at Ariadne. Um, Ariadne, you know, she microdosed to reconnect. She described this, you know, reconnect with some of the things that I wasn't able to connect with anymore because this obligation of owning a business was so massive. And she described microdosing as spiritual and shared how microdosing for her challenges cultural injustice. Uh, an example of cultural injustice for her, um, you know, was the, you know, Western culture's relationship to, um, earth, you know, to, to nature, to, to non-humans. Um, and she found that for her, microdosing gave her, you know, a sense of optimism, of hopefulness that, you know, ah, you know, maybe there's some cultural healing, you know, through this practice. And um, Thunder also found this um, to be uh, true as well. For, for Thunder, microdosing contributed to an overall feeling that Western medicine was moving in a positive direction, stating, I feel optimistic and hopeful, you know? And this is from someone who was prescribed uh, opiates for 20 years for an injury that, you know, she, 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 didn't, need, she didn't need them for that reason. You know? And so then we're gonna take a look at, you know, meaning that came through for both Thunder and Malia, um, personal integrity and responsibility. Uh, for Malia, she started out with a lot of hesitancy using psychedelics or uh, hallucinogens, um, uh, psilocybin. She, she described having some stigmatized beliefs associated with being high and, you know, dissociating, uh, lack of self-care. Uh, she initially chose to, you know, microdose and, you know, was very hesitant about this, but she found that for her, you know, microdosing was a way that she could take control of her um, mental health and feel a sense of you know personal accountability and um, agency, you know. And then you know Thunder, who microdosed in order to address ADHD as well as her sense of fullness, also found that the microdosing you know supported a sense of I think for her integrity and you know uh, responsibility. And there's a couple um, actually quotes. Um, uh, so from Malia, she she said of you know, I, I feel like I'm bringing myself back to myself. Um, I'm bringing myself back to being aware of the things that have gone unassessed. 
you know, and that she says, I, I feel like I want to take control of my mental health, you know, through this. And then Thunder, she says, I feel honored to have the opportunity to be on the side, to, to be the good example instead of always the bad example, you know, um, is something that she took on, you know, in her kind of history. And that's going to come through my actions and walking with integrity and courage and just, you know, it's going to show. And I feel optimistic and hopeful. So this is, this is a not, these are, these meaning they're non-pharmacological effects, right? They're, they're effects that the people, you know, perhaps benefits that people are uh, receiving, um, but, you know, how, how are the, how are they being, uh, you know, prompted by the pharmacological effects, the, the, uh, the through, you know, the 5-HT2A serotonin receptor that, that psilocybin um, um, acts upon. So then the final uh, main theme, support and wellness, we're going to take a look at. And all the participants describe changes in mood or emotion associated with microdosing that were um, important and meaningful aspects of their experience. And for some, mood was a main factor or intention. For others, like Paul or June, uh, it was an unintended but appreciated effect. Relaxation, um, something to note, three out of five participants shared stories that conveyed experiences of relaxation while microdosing. Um, and I just want to read some, some quotes to, to share what, what people had to say. And Thunder, Thunder shared, you know, I get frustrated very quickly if I can't understand something or figure something out. Low dosing, she, she's referring to microdosing, um, helps with that. It allows space for me to understand something, it gives me patience and presence to move through slower and just acceptance and surrender. Um, and so she's talking about a slowing down process and actually having patience to kind of move through what she, she doesn't necessarily understand. And this is an overall experience that we can, you know, look at to, to, to understand how is this experience um, aiding her in eliminating the need for Adderall. You know, here she's really talking about like, hey, there's a slowing down and it's surrender and it's helping me with my with my focus. Um, and then Malia shared, I felt more creative and more social and I wanted to do things that uh, and had a sense of productivity that I hadn't been experiencing for a long time. And um, Ariadne, she, she shared, I think it, microdosing helps me, I think mostly, with not focusing on the stuff I, I don't have. It helped her to feel grateful. She says, I want to move through this life in gratuity and love, and I want to focus on the things that I, I do have. June, she shared, it seems, it just seems like there's more of a flow. My body relaxes, so the flow of the mind will be passing without me getting involved in it. And here she's particularly talking about um, how she really appreciated you know, she described one one time when she she went to a, a meditation. She found that you know that that her her mind wasn't so distracting. Um, so, uh, and then Malia says, "I was like, oh my gosh, you know, it made things feel like I could just slow down and think about them. Just kind of created a simple relaxation." And then Paul, uh, want to take a look at Paul here. And he noticed uh, that a uh, more suppleness and energy in his body, and he he shared that you know he does quite a bit of physical work, so he found it very helpful. I want to take a look at some of the literature. In a study by Hutton, found that people with ADHD reported microdosing to be more effective than conventional treatments such as therapy or medication. People also found microdosing more effective than macrodosing psilocybin um, for ADHD. Uh, so interesting to note, given a um, little bit of what, what Thunder shared. And so the research has also shown that now this is shifting in. We're going to take a look, a little closer look at, at, at Paul um, and his, his experience of reduced pain. Just wanted to share that research has shown that certain antidepressants um, decrease neural inflammation. And this is causing researchers to explore decreased inflammation as a mechanism of treating um, depression. And it is interesting given that Paul felt that the microdosing helped to decrease his, his inflammation. Um, and so, you know, good to note that um, he, he was not struggling with depression, but there's a, 
there's a potential correlation here between inflammation and depression. Um, and uh, in the research on uh, psilocybin, as well as the 5-HT2A agonists, um, research has shown that psilocybin produces pro-inflammatory mediators, resulting in anti-inflammatory effects. And this study was done on uh, human, human cells. And then there's also a couple studies that have shown that evidence of anti-inflammatory effects from 5-HT2A agonists, such as psilocybin is a 5-HT2A agonist. Um, and that study was done on animals. Um, not that I condone studies on animals, but there you have it. Okay. So I want to move through and take a look at this sub-theme, agency and addiction. And all the participants shared personal stories of past or current experiences with addictive substances. And not, not that all had experienced addiction, but it was a topic that came up for everyone. Four out of five participants believe that microdosing uh, helped them to achieve a healthier um, relationship with substances. So first wanna take just a, a look at Thunder. You know, she felt that, she says, microdosing is helping me. I tend to be a woman of large appetite and I just I always, I tend to want, really want more and more of something. Um, I, I kind of like to feel overwhelmed. So microdosing is patiently helping me to appreciate the subtleties. So uh, with this, you know, there's a way in which, you know, a further question would be, does the practice of taking subtle, you know, a dose for subtle effects, really paying attention to that dose. Um, is that uh, also offering lessons on how people can kind of um, maybe shift patterns in which they, their you know, patterns that are sort of organized around, you know, maybe overwhelm or chaos or, you know, kind of wanting to just be completely, uh, uh, what, you know, opened in an in a extreme sense. And uh, how, how might this um, relate to, you know, moderation and, you know, treatment of addiction? So uh, then, uh, see, Paul says, I feel that microdosing psilocybin really helps me find the balance point. Um, I'm also gonna, just gonna jump down to June here because I'm gonna talk about them. June says, I do feel microdosing is cleansing myself of some habits that, you know, probably don't work so well for me. and. You know, Paul found, Paul, both Paul and June found that when they were microdosing psilocybin, um, their kind of their, their, uh, their tendency to, to, to move towards uh, wine, you know, they, they, they drink, they drink wine, they drink alcohol, you know, quite in moderation, but they just found that they, they wanted, you know, wine less. And um, Paul also found that he, he wanted uh, cannabis less, and that was helpful for him. And then June um, shared that she, you know, occasionally smokes tobacco. And she found that when she was microdosing psilocybin, she, she did not want to um, smoke tobacco. So really interesting. And then Malia also uh, shared, if you stop a prescription medication, there's going to be some sort of a withdrawal feeling. And I didn't have that with microdosing. I did have an eagerness to feel you know, good, but I also, it was not, it didn't feel like an addiction. And for Malia, this was very important because she, you know, she, she wanted, I think, to, to feel a sense of, you know, control. And she was concerned, you know, about uh, using psilocybin and there being stigmatization around, you know, addiction and people just, her words were, you know, doing, uh, people doing it to just kind of get outside of themselves. So, and moving right along on to a uh, sense of connection. So, Important to note that in the literature, there's an increased sense of connection um, to people or the environment is a benefit um, that's been reported by other microdosers within the literature. And four out of five participants described their own experiences of feeling connected when they talked about microdosing. For three of the, of the four participants, uh, the connection was either a primary goal for them or it was felt to be a meaningful aspect of their experience. And you know, Ariadne, who was motivated to microdose in part for connection, felt that microdosing offered um, different kinds of connection. She says, I think it's connection, connecting with all different kinds of things, whatever you need, whether it's your purpose, 
or your pause and slowing down or your or your space. And you know, Thunder, um, she she shared microdosing helps me to slow down and just appreciate the present moment instead of you know escaping. June also shared, you know, it helps my mind not get in the way so much. I'm really taking in the teaching or the, you know, if you want to call it the teaching or the energy, the guidance, the help, the love, and my mind is not getting in the way so much. And something that I wanted to acknowledge about June is that she, she, she did find that sometimes she would have what some people maybe may experience as uncomfortable emotions. She, she had some grief arise and she found this valuable, um, but she also uh, had, you know, practice, you know, in just being with these, you know, more kind of un quote unquote uncomfortable emotions. And so it's interesting to know, okay, well, what is microdosing psilocybin like for, you know, people who might not have these supportive practices. And some of the literature suggested that microdosing psilocybin, you know, it increases uh, potentially uh, neuroticism um, or anxiety. And one, one question would be, well, is it, you know, is it, kind of bringing up, you know, very subtle, but maybe a different experience for people that if they don't have um, a, a way to kind of meet that, that um, different experience, they might, it might, you know, bring up uh, anxiety, you know, discomfort. So, okay. Oh, and just before moving on to manageable side effects, I wanted to read one more quote from Thunder. Um, she says, it microdosing has reconnected me with the innocent inner child something that I lost, and self-love, and uh, I'm being able to listen, and I'm able to see and hear the synchronicities that are all around me all day long that remind me that I'm on the right path. I lost that compass for a long time, and it's so reassuring. It's a big difference to walk in the universe that is trustworthy than being a part of something that's just confusing and chaotic and unwelcoming. Then wanted to take a look at um, manageable side effects. In the study, uh, the side effects were considered, you know, anything that, you know, were effects that were unwanted or effects that um, were initially perceived as uncomfortable. And the really important finding here was that, you know, everyone was able to minimize, if not eliminate, uh, side effects through uh, changing up their protocol um, or making adjustments. Uh, something I didn't know, mention is Ariadne, for example, she actually did try the microdosing at first for the purpose of depression using a schedule of once every three days. And she found that this was not effective, but you know, when she kind of took up her own set of practices and changed her intention, you know, she, she well, you know, one of the, something that came up for her was, was cultural healing as well as connection. Um, so Paul acknowledged, you know, the biggest difference is that, what for him, he noticed that actually the biggest difference is that with the cannabis, I'm not as intelligent. Um, he was taking cannabis to, to manage pain, but he found that the microdosing did not, microdosing psilocybin didn't have that, that effect on his, his um, sense of cognition. And then uh, Malia, you know, really appreciated that with microdosing, you can start and stop anytime. She also did find that pairing food uh, with the dose eliminated um, some, some stomach discomfort that she was experiencing. And then Thunder did acknowledge uh, a user error or where if she didn't precisely measure, sometimes she'd have a little bit too much and she'd over she'd overdose. And that's something that comes up um, in the in in kind of reading in the literature as one of the more common uh, side effects that people report. And so okay, when when looking at you know when people are reporting anxiety, neuroticism, um, you know tiredness, all these, these side effects. Uh, an important question is, again, you know, what is their dose and are they maybe dosing a little bit too much, a little too less? And just taking a look at some of the side effects in the literature, um, worsening in depression, anxiety, memory, 14.65%, and sociability, 11.15. Um, and this was a by Cameron. And then also um, Polito and Stevenson found that there's a slight increase in neuroticism. Implications for future study, just gonna go through this pretty quickly. Um, uh, found that there were, you know, a, a, well, a rich, rich array of suggestions for future studies, um, including those with 
it having to do with scheduling dosage, set and settings, meaning response, substance use, and connection and mood. Um, just real quick, uh, schedule and dosage. Here's some of the literature, you know, again, acknowledging that, you know, people oftentimes have to kind of work at finding their right dose. And um, so this being important for future study. And then the set and setting. Um, so it's unknown how prayer, which Thunder did a little prayer every time she, she microdosed. Um, uh, Ari Ariadne, she uh, sometimes brought in rituals. June, her, her supportive practices. Paul, you know, the physical exercise. It's unknown how this is interacting with any of the pharmacological effects um, that the participants are, are experiencing overall. And uh, some more research needed here. Meaning response. Um, just want to start, you know, with a little quote by Ariadne. She felt, you know, I think that microdosing is going to help me uh, with with what's see what's right. And you know, in in psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, you know, quite different than microdosing. It, it's also been found that the therapeutic effect is significantly shaped by the meaning made from the psychedelic experience. Um, so, you know more research needed to see, you know, for example, how is meaning response um, maybe amplifying placebo effect and how, you know, how to, how to work with this um, when, you know, doing, you know, say double blind placebo studies. Um, let's see, addiction and moderation. Um, here's a little bit more in a study by Lee uh, reported that 19.5% uh, re reported tobacco cessation uh, 42% reduced alcohol, 25% um, reduced cannabis. So, you know, based on what, you know, my participants uh, expressed as well as, you know, this study, again, a lot more to understand, you know, about, you know, what's happening with microdosing when people are saying that it's, it's supporting them and feeling more balanced and, you know, able to kind of moderate their usage. And, you know, again, is their instruction just even in, you know, the practice of, instruction for, you know, moderation balance, even in the practice of being very intentional about, you know, small dose for subtle effects, um, rather than the, you know, the big, the, the, the big ones. Um, and uh, let's see. I want to go on to um, mood and connection. And, you know, microdosing is no better than placebo. Uh, this was a study found by C. Hetty, and there's also been another study just recently that's come out to suggest that microdosing is, is no better than placebo. There's a lot of work here to be done to understand, you know, uh, kind of how to manage uh, breaking blind. You know, for example, people is it's like, what's, what's the dose and the, the effect that's being intended and how to manage for breaking blind, how to manage people not actually knowing that they're, they're, they're microdosing. Um, also, how does a lab setting influence um, you know, the effects of microdosing? And an important one is prior relationship to psychedelics, because this can affect the, you know, the expectations and the meaning, you know, that, that is imbued in a person's experience. Uh, of course, more research needed on, you know, inflammation and mood. Um, and I, I also did, I forgot to mention that the, the combination that Paul and June were using with, with uh, lion's mane and turmeric those are also anti-inflammatories. So, you know, again, what, what, what's the inflammatory, you know, capacity for just microdosing psilocybin? And then what, what's happening when, when there's the, the Paul Stamets stack, so to speak. Um, and then again, you know, how might supportive practices support, uh, allow for microdosing psilocybin to manage maybe difficult emotions that come up? And just last, uh, connection. Uh, a study by Polito and Stevenson found that, found that, Significant decreases in mind wandering for respondents in their study uh, happened while, and deep, while deep absorption or deep focus increased. And the default modal network, uh, this is associated with decreased mind wandering when it's uh, kind of activity and the, the DMN is lowered. And so more research is also needed to understand we, we know that in full doses of psychedelics, the, there's the, the, de, the default modal network is kind of uh, the activity there's lowered. And so what is happening with, 
you know, that, that area in the brain as well as um, in conjunction with, with microdosing? And is it creating, you know, potential for decrease in mind wandering, um, you know, increased absorption, focus? And is this, you know, something that we can look at as also sort of potentiating, you know, increased overall, you know, connection? So uh, that is the end of my uh, presentation for now. I just want to thank all the, uh, I want to thank my committee as well as uh, the, all of the, the psychedelic researchers that, you know, were mentioned here and all of the ones that, you know, I didn't um, include uh, in this particular presentation. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. So, um, so far um, with your input, and we will now first as a committee have an opportunity to ask a few questions and uh, get some further uh, clarifications or your thoughts on specific uh, themes or issues that arise for the committee members. I'd like to get us started with our external member, Dr. Colbert. Uh, Rob, uh, would you start us out into the conversation? Any feedback you have for Sarah? Any questions you want to ask? And um, sometimes the conversation sort of evolves uh, and uh, we can take a second round for each of us if further questions come up, but please go ahead. Um, any feedback, one or two questions, and then we'll go with uh, Sam next. Yes, thank you very much, Helgi. Um, and yeah, congratulations, Sarah. Um, it's exciting to be at this uh, the step of peer review. Um, and so congratulations on making it all the way here and what a wonderful presentation. So, um, you know, just with the end there, uh, I really did appreciate, you know, doing, doing very well to cover, you know, where more research can be done. Um, and also really wanted to, to thank you for, um, yeah, I think it was, it was wonderful how you introduced uh, your participants and their lives in the context of, of uh, where they were approaching microdosing. And so I really appreciated that. I, um, yeah, I think the narrative inquiry, you did a, a fantastic job with that. Um, so let's see. I did want to inquire, uh, do you think that you bumped up against any limitations with narrative inquiry um, and your, just uh, anything that you wish you could have um, maybe covered or gathered more, or maybe uh, that a different methodology might have provided, um, whether quantitative or qualitative? Uh, yes, certainly. I did feel that because I used narrative inquiry as the lens uh, rather than a methodology um, such as uh, like a, you know, a theoretical, um, like grounded theory. I, I couldn't um, create a theoretical model that might guide the practice of microdosing. It'd be really fantastic to see a grounded theory um, approach uh, to, to, I mean, you could take kind of everything I did here and then, you know, apply grounded theory and then see, see uh, what theoretical model might come out of that. So um, that would you know, certainly be very rich. Um, you know, another limitation was certainly that the, I didn't, I didn't control for, for any variable. I, I, I controlled very minimally. And so there were variables that came in such as, um, you know, even Paul or Paul and June and combining, you know, microdosing psilocybin with the supplements. And then I had uh, Ariadne who shared that at times, you know, she, here, here she's, she's talking about microdosing psilocybin and then she, then she goes in and says, but you know, sometimes I, I combine it with uh, opiates, a, a slight dose of opiates and a slight dose of cannabis. And so that, that was, you know, that, that was something that I really had to sit, step back and say, okay, you know, what's going on here? Um, but what did come out of that is that I, I looked at all of the, the studies that were, uh, you know, present at the time, and it, it seemed that, that there wasn't much attention to that, you know, in the survey questions, you know, were people pairing, 
my, including microdosing psilocybin with, you know, other substances. So, um, you know, controlling for variables just to kind of get a more kind of clarified, clarified sense of, of what's going on. Um, and then of course the population, you know, it's certainly, it's not generalizable. Um, you know, for example, what, what might have said this exact same study, uh, be like on maybe participants who, uh, had, who, who were psychedelic naive, you know, cause we're finding in the, you know, in, in a lot of the, right, the, the research that, uh, it really does make an impact if, if people have, uh, experiences with past experiences with hallucinogens and, and, uh, the, you know. Yeah. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, something you had uh, mentioned uh, toward the beginning is uh, this um, lack of regulation, and so I kind of wanted to gather your thought on if you think that there uh, is uh, any uh, regulation that might benefit uh, the folks, uh, your participants, um, uh, and, if, and if it is, what, what that regulation might look like, what might be useful to help protect folks? Oh, that's a great question. Let me sit with that for a minute. Well, you know, I'm thinking of. Yeah, I'm thinking of. I, you know, I don't. I'm actually thinking of approaches. You know, harm, harm reduction approaches, and you know, for example, you know, when um, you know need, needles are provided to you know give give a you know a, a source to you know people um, who are who are you you know using needles and and to kind of minimize the the um, ne negative effects. And so if I were to kind of apply that to microdosing psilocybin, um, you know, certainly if, if there were some guidelines on, on dosage, you know, recommended dosage and, you know, even just uh, ways that people could e easily access information around, you know, uh, grinding, like grind, grinding up psilocybin, um, because they're grinding up the mushroom because there's, you know, different amounts of psilocybin and, and, and so to kind of, um, you know, that would be helpful in minimizing the, the overdose. Um, I mean, as, as far as I, I can tell, given the, the research that's showing, you know, that, that there's actually very, there's minimal potential for harm um, from psilocybin, you know, de decriminalizing, you know, the more that states can, can dec decriminalize and so to, to, to alleviate, uh, to, to, you know, just open up possibility for, you know, people to ex exchange and share information. Um, uh, and, and also to, you know, be able to have them, you know, perhaps feel more comfortable to go to their um, medical pro providers and say, hey, no, I'm, um, you know, that's, that's another thing is, you know, is ways to have people feel more comfortable to go to their medical providers and say, Hey, I'm, you know, looking to microdose and I, you know, I want to do that to, to go off of my medication. Um, you know, that's can be, can be risky. So. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah. And I think that that, um, for this moment in time, that's one of the, uh, major contributions, um, that qualitative, uh, research like this offer is that, um, yeah, nothing that you offered was regulating to protect these people from themselves, um, but really making sure that they were able to uh, have good information about what they took and share that information with their care providers. So I, I appreciate that. I think you're right. So um, with that, oh, I, uh, I I feel well and um, I'll, I'll pass it off to uh, the, the next committee member. But thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much, Rob. All right, Sarah. Well, I really enjoyed your presentation and, uh, you know, your um, artistic spirit came through in the images on the slides and, uh, and also, you know, how echoing Rob, how you focused, uh, you chose to focus your presentation on the narrative, right, of the participants and, you know, also wanting to let know the audience members that you do have a very uh, rigorous theoretical, you know, 
literature review, right? That's supporting all that, which is evident, right? As you're bringing in the research. So I thought there, you did a nice, very nice balance in the presentation of letting us feel the experience of these participants, right? Let us feel what it's like to microdose. And at the same time, then bringing in a slide, here's some research, right? Supporting that. So I thought overall your presentation was beautifully balanced and skillfully rendered. And there's a few pieces that I'm excited about, many pieces that I'm excited about. Um, but one in particular is, I think echoing a little bit what Rob was saying in terms of the regulation piece. And then when it comes to the full dose, you know, empirical research where they're showing that um, the positive mystical insights, increase in meaning, cessation of addiction, all these kinds of um, outcomes, but they're also done in a particular set and setting um, with particular guides, right, within that context. And so, you know, you mentioned a few times the possibility of microdosing to reveal what is inside, and sometimes inside is something that's not pleasant, right? It could be trauma, it could be, um, that could be a possible reason, a likely reason for the increase in neuroticism and anxiety. And so what I was thinking is just wanting to ask you if you've thought about um, how you would see microdosing as a therapeutic adjunct. And, you know, within the mental health setting, you, you know, mental health practitioners have the, you know, the skills to support clients with their um, pharmacological um, psychiatric medications, right? How's the medication going and you know, what effects is it having? Um, and so, you know, it also seems like microdosing, the possibility of bringing that in, having a guide, and then having the microdose be an adjunct or a tool. And so I just was wondering if you could say a little bit about, have you thought about that, um, the importance or, um, yeah, what role a guide might play in that? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, First off, the yeah, I I I I I I was kind of surprised to really understand how the meaning making process for individuals uh, was you know aided in I think their description of overall benefit and so you know a, a guide could be one who participates in you know pulling out the threads of those meanings and sort of reflecting them back to. Um, maybe even amplify, you know, amplify that, that experience. Um, I, I do, you, you were saying, you were saying, oh, well, you know, it's, it's so for, uh, you know, mental health practitioners, the, their role can be to facilitate and support um, that process. And I would say that for, for some mental health pr practitioners, you know, you know, the, the, the practitioners, I think would really need to not be, um, well, in, in my opinion, I, I feel that the, the meaning and the overall experience that people receive could be a, a richer, um, you know, from microdosing psilocybin if they're working with a guide who's not um, extremely cognizantric, right? And so, you know, guide, um, a therapist, a, you know, coach who's um, also, you know, pulling in from, you um, you know, other, from other dimensions of, of being human, right? Um, spirituality um, has a recognition of, oh, well, maybe this person has a relationship to what they define as soul, you know, um, um, uh, you know, indigenous wisdom traditions. Um, someone with a, 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 you know, steeped in a background could very much, um, you know, facilitate a, a uh, a process for help facilitate a process, you know, for individuals to use microdosing psilocybin to, you know, see perhaps what they've not been able to prior, you know, see or to, you know, feel, um, integrate um, experiences. So. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, my thoughts as well. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, the fact that it went from one study when you started you know, to 45. I remember the opening of your dissertation for a while was the only study to date is this one study. <laughs> and then you're like, 
actually there's another study and another study and another like oh how do i make sense of this so <laughs> you've been, how do how do i uh, add another chapter to, to the lit review and do i want to yeah <laughs> i have to yeah <laughs> exactly yeah um i also really want to applaud you know the shift that you've made in the neurobiolog neurobiological section from just a brain focused again cognitive centric you know to use the word you just brought up to you know bringing in inflammation bringing in the microbiome bringing in you know other systems um, and i wonder if you could just share a little bit about how that inspiration came about and if there's any other insights you had you know in this presentation you've talked about inflammation and then in your dissertation you extend that to the microbiome just kind of briefly and hypothetically because it doesn't appear there's a lot of research there but just wanting to hear if there's any you know personal anecdotes or insights or how that expansion came about sure thank you um let me think here it you know, in, in some ways it was, it was following, it was following the threads. I remember I sat down and just wanted to rework that a little bit, that, that section on the neurobiology. And it was always bothering me personally. Cause I, I, I saw, so wow, I did the thing that I don't want to do. I, I gave such emphasis on, you know, the brain and how, you know, the, so serotonin or psilocybin uh, being a 5-H2-T2A agonist, right? I, you know, had a section on that. And I also had a section on, you know, the, the psilocybin research that's come out initially by um, Carhart Harris uh, to, to suggest that there's, you know, very strong um, relationship between, you know, min reducing depression and uh, its effects on the default mode network. So that was, you know, that was fine. That was amazing. But I still I was like, oh, I'm, I'm still being very brain focused here. And I think it was just in sitting with the story of Paul that I then got curious about, well, what is all of the research that's out there to sit, that's been done on the relationship between um, the, the serotonergic agonists um, at, in conjunction with um, inflammation. And it was very exciting to find that there were, you know, there was not one, but, you know, several studies. And, you know, then I started looking at, wow, well, what's, oh, there's, you know, there's, there's this thing called, um, you know, immunopsychiatry now, right? There's a field of immunopsychiatry where, you know, they're looking at the relationship between, you know, inflammation and, you know, a range of uh, um, con conditions, you know, depression, anxiety, um, chronic stress. And so, you know, then, you know, as, as well as, a, um, you know, of course, inflammation and auto, autoimmune you know, disorders. And so then, you know, that, that, that exploration was just personally meaningful for me because I have, you know, people, I, I, I just, I hear so often it, how, how much, how far, you know, what West, Western medicine needs to come to, to in order to really get a, an understanding of how, how to work with, you know, autoimmune, you know, disorders and that, that, that they are on the rise and, you know, why is that happening and how, it, how can that be, you know, uh, understood from an ecological, right, um, you know, point of view. And so just, I, for me, it was very beautiful to, to think of um, psychedelics being um, woven into this, uh, to this process. And then uh, there was a study by Kui Kui Kuipers, K-U-Y, P-E-R-S, Kuipers, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. But um, she, I do apologize. I like to think that Kuipers is a she, but probably is not. Um, <laughs> Kuipers uh, was the one who suggested that, wow, oh, well, you know, there's, there 95% of the serotonin receptors are in the, are in the gut, right? And so is microdosing actually uh, impacting people from, you know, changes you know, to the microbiome. And that, you know, that was exciting because of course the microbiome then weaves back into inflammation um, as, you know, as well as all that I've just spoken about. And so it was just following a thread. And, you know, by the end of it, I was just, I was very, um, just, it was so meaningful to see how, 
in my own process of looking at the sort of the biological, you know, um, the neurobiology of psilocybin, I was able to see, you know, oh, well, here's a, here's starting to look at a more whole body, right? It's not just the brain, it's, you know, the whole body, you know, that's, that's in process and being impacted by um, psilocybin. And how much is it being impacted by microdosing? Hey, let's do some more research. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. No, it's very exciting. I really appreciate that shift because, you know, as you've emphasized in your talk, you know, bringing in not only the pharmacological impact, right, of neuroplasticity and the its effect yeah. on the default, yeah. you know, mode network and serotonergic pathways, but also, you know, there's the subjective existential impact, but it's not just a brain impact as well. It's a whole bodied, you know, impact. So, you know, the potential of these medicines, you know, of not only having this, psychological, um, positive psychological impact, you know, which, you know, psychiatric medications do as well, but having a positive overall impact on gut health, on inflammation, you know, the potentials for that, whereas, as we know, psychiatric medications um, have some shortcomings in that arena in general. So um, just applauding your work on that and everything. And I might have another comment coming around, but wanting to pass it over to Helge for now. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. Uh, already alluding to a few themes that I was also interested in. Um, Sarah, congratulations. Uh, beautiful presentation. And I too also really appreciated um, how you were uh, sort of privileging the experience and the narratives in what you shared with us today and for the audience i too want to say that you have a very strong uh, and interesting fascinating lit review for anybody who is interested in all the ins and outs uh, of of this research and and not just the biochemistry in the brain but also you know where the field is at and um, you were able to bring that in i really liked how you told the stories without sort of over generalizing or over promising what this limited narrative study in scope uh, limited can can tell us. Uh, but yet there were these parallels, these really interesting parallels uh, of what your participants experienced and what the literature with larger populations uh, um, quantitative studies also seem to suggest. So I think that worked that worked really well. And another aspect of your lit review and that maybe leads me into my question was that uh, there's sort of a flavor that you discuss of um, sort of taking back uh, authority over one's well-being and healing process that is a part of this um, underground uh, and kind of not your word, but that's sort of the flavor, revolutionary act in a in a way of saying, I've tried all these other methods, uh, I've struggled with certain issues in my life uh, for a long time, and I'm I want to try something else now. I want to try this thing, and it's sort of uh, a a creative, but also a little bit of a wild west, unregulated area, between lack of uh, medical guidance with, uh, and uh, legal implications and so forth. But where, where you were also thinking about um, that this is sort of has something to do with agency and with, with uh, a sense of inner authority that people were not only approaching uh, microdosing, but then also how they found their way in it and what's right for them. Yeah, that's sort of a theme in here. What's, what's right for, for the individual patient. And so like Rob and uh, Sam already asked, uh, you know, the need for regulation, whether it's to uh, prevent abuse or misuse or just have better and more effective experiences with uh, cert having certain regulatory uh, suggestions uh, for, for the use as well as uh, potentially guidance through therapists or other counselors that are trained in this um, are themes that I'm that I'm also thinking about how could this look right so that there is still agency and freedom within maybe a further support and sort of supportive 
containment that is not currently that is not currently existing. Um, um, so, you know, the theme of making a making a choice for one's well-being. Maybe you can speak a little bit to a potential shadow side of all of this as you know, on one side, there's a commercialization and sort of a commodification that is happening on through patents and industries that are interested in this. But also maybe on the on the side of the consumer, uh, the, on the on the patient side could potentially, despite the beautiful benefits and, and potentials that you're highlighting, could there be also yet another uh, sort of consumerist um, tendency in this of taking yet another pill to fulfill something inside uh, without uh, you know sort of deeper work or that it's the the solutions are still coming from the outside now it's not this pill now it's a psilocybin microdose necessarily that this sort of consumer uh, behavior in all of this could potentially be also a problem if, if you think about that as we're as we're trying to, or as the field is trying to establish itself and be wise and smart, uh, is there sort of a shadow side that you could also see? You spoke a little bit about some of the participants who were mixing with other substances and so forth. Um, do you see that as a problem or do you feel like what what the stories that you've heard and uh, the other research that you're familiar with, it's really different when it comes to psilocybin as far as uh, how people approach it and what it then does also in in their changed life experience sure thank you um, it, it's uh it's it's interesting because I you know working also as a as a psychotherapist I'm I'm thinking of I'm thinking of instances that it's come up in my practice um, and I don't even share with my uh, uh, people my my clients the the the, the well that I'm even doing this um, but I, but trying to think how in a you know, good way I can you know kind of glean from some of these threads. Um, Certainly. So, whether whether microdosing is regulated or not, you know, right now, um, it still is a practice that, like many practices, uh, you know, you, or or self explorations, right, self enhancements. Um, can bring people potentially into a more integrated sense of themselves, you know, and, and having an integrated experience could also very much see how microdosing psilocybin could um, be taken and contribute to a uh, kind of a, a split um, within oneself. For example, let's say someone is um, microdosing psilocybin because they uh, don't feel connected. And through microdosing psilocybin, they're um, really tapping into kind of an imaginal, you know, imaginal realm that maybe that imaginal realm has been uh, kind of very protective for them um, due to say trauma. You know, sometimes um, that, that can be a source of, you know, protection and uh, survival for people who experience profound trauma, right? They have, you know, maybe rich uh, imag imaginal capacity. Um, so if, you know, in the intention of microdosing psilocybin for the purpose of connection, it, you know, a person is then leaning into their, or their comfortable way of, of connect, feeling connected, right? Then if, uh, you know, it's, it, it, it could further, you know, kind of in some ways further a, a disconnection where the imaginal, you know, realm is being leaned upon rather than, 
you know, f facilitating the experience as a way to, you know, see what it's like to um, connect with people, um, to connect with, uh, with one's environment. And so it could then lead to, you know, further maybe disconnection. Um, that's what I mean by split. Um, you know, I would also say that if microdosing, you know, microdosing anything, you know, psilocybin or, you know, even well, psilocybin um, is done for the purposes of, uh, you know, it's all about, in I mean, I'm speaking here to intention. There's, there's other ways to look at this, but, you know, an intention of, say, um, fe feeling strong and healthy in one's body. Well, that strong and healthy, you know, what does that mean? How is that being, you know, experienced? Is that, is that meaning kind of control, you know, control over one's body and control over the presentation, you know, of one's body such that, you know, uh, there's, there, microdosing is not being used to, you know, further an acceptance and appreciation and, and sensuality for, you know, the body as is, while also, yeah, feeling, you know, stronger within. So um, that is a wonderful question, because I, 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 I just answered it with, you know, focusing on intention. Um, but, you know, yeah, those are yeah. some shadow sides. I don't, I don't know if I even, at, did I, no, no, I, th I think, you know, uh, I wasn't looking for one specific answer. Um, and I like how you're thinking about it. And the the distinction of something that, that integrates and connect maybe versus something that numbs or dissociates from one's uh, current life situation or experience, it could be a really qualitative uh, difference and a signature that is really different from a lot of other um, you know, pharmaceutical possibilities, whether they're taken for psychiatric uh, uh, reasons or for enhancement, as you're also discussing. Are you aware of um, in the other studies, in the many studies that are uh, blossoming and mushrooming uh, currently on microdosing, have other studies paid attention to set and setting? Because, you know, in the in the research studies on not only with psilocybin full dose, but uh, MDMA and so forth, as well as in the trainings uh, that are coming uh, out of these, you know, probably soon elevated to FDA approval, uh, other psychedelic treatments, how much attention there is paid to set and setting? Yeah? Do any of the microdosing studies have already leaned into that direction? with sort of a further um, further control, regulatory, um, uh, paying attention towards uh, uh, do not only dosing, you mentioned that a little bit, but also in terms of set and setting, intentionality to, to see the effects of that rather than, you know, the really full open-ended exploratory use that uh, certainly your participants that was part of their their journey with with these uh, microdosing medicines. Uh, yes, predominantly the I mean the the focus it, the focus is just starting just starting to be teased out just starting to be um, kind of pulled into the research predominantly in the. Uh, say the double blind controlled studies or at least the you know the the studies that are trying to control for placebo effect um i i don't know i don't i can't remember the name of i can't remember who did it but it was a study on microdosing lsd and they found that uh there was the the only i think it's like the only effect was for a a bit of a tiredness and then in there, I have it in my study, but or in my in my study, but uh, it, the their response about the tiredness was, well, maybe it's because oh, here it is. It's um, it's by fam. The study was done by family in 2020, and it was um, placebo controlled. It had four doses of LSD, and uh, there weren't any cognitive changes except for sleepiness. But they said maybe it was because the the participants were in bed all day, in the lab setting. So I just thought that was so funny. Um, <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, there's, 
there's in, in at least a couple of the recent placebo studies they've they've mentioned well what you know like how is even you know going into a lab um using instrument these these measurements to try and you know filling out surveys measure measurements to try and you know understand what's going on with cognition or depression how is this actually um you know perhaps either impacting the overall experience you know as people are trying to either think about my, their experience microdosing or they're actually you know microdosing within the you know the lab setting um So another one, uh, there was there was a, a study on by Pro Chaskova who did a it was a sort of field based slash lab study where they had um, people microdose psilocybin and then come up, come in and do uh, these activities to to measure creativity and they found that in that particular study the the cre the the convergent thinking, creativity, mainly through convergent thinking actually improved, but they were actually curious if uh, just pairing microdosing with the, the creativity practice actually initi initiated a, you know, experience of creativity. So that's, that's, you know, that's giving attention to set and setting. And that's interesting because in another, another study that was, um, it was not controlled. It, well, yeah, it was not controlled. It was it was more field based by Polito and Stevenson. That took place over the course of six weeks. It was interesting. They they wanted to look uh, at how people's expectations impacted their experiences, and the experiences were you know measured through you know ver various um, in, you know instruments um, uh, measures, and then uh, they they found that while people expected to have their creativity improved. It that it shown no improvement, and so then that that goes back to the other you know the Brochaskova study. It's like okay, well, what about when people actually pair you know pair the the practice with a with an with a create creative activity, which um, Ariadne did intentionally in in my in my study. She you know she said I sometimes like to actually do art you know to 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 you know connect with what matters. So. Fascinating. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, let's see if there's any uh, follow up questions from from Rob and Sam. I'm good. Uh, thank you so much, Sarah. Rob and Sam, did you have any further questions for Sarah? None. Not necessarily. I mean, I could keep asking questions all day. You know, the revolutionary piece that Helge mentioned was the one thing that I would say, you know, because Sarah, you do focus on that in the dissertation, particularly the the role of power in, you know, institutional kind of dominance over a particular um, approach to health. And um, so you have that subversive element. And so I my only thing was just wanting you to speak a little bit to the subversive political cultural implications, but it's not needed either because I've read it all and I know it, but I think it'd be worth, you know, for the audience to hear perhaps. Sure. Sure. Well, I just, yes, I, uh, you know, I, I looked at microdosing as being a practice that was informed, but not like inscribed by, um, institutionalized norms. And economic values of Western medicine, and you know, I did this. I sort of set the context uh, by reviewing the shift from dynamic psychiatry to diagnostic psychiatry. Dynamic being more psychoanalytic uh, or analytic, and you know, diagnostic being more the biomedical approach to psychiatry. And looked at how, with the publishing of the DSM three. Um, this shift allowed for the pharmaceutical industry in conjunction with psychiatry to become, you know, and the institutionalized power that we now, you know, have today. And, um, you know, I, I wanted to focus on, I wanted, I then brought from that discussion, or from from that overview, a, a bit more discussion on how the, you know, biological stance towards mental health you know, does not adequately uh, and, you know, reliance upon this scientific validation, you know, and 
the DSM, DSM as a, you know, legitimized uh, form of knowledge is absolutely, it's not taking into account mental health as including other dimensions of experience, such as, you know, psychodynamic, um, eco-psychological, ecological, um, and then of course from, you know, indigenous uh, or shamanic, you know, wisdom traditions. Um, so if we use Foucault to understand that, you know, power functions through, uh, through discourse, um, discourse, you know, referring to, you know, the knowledge and meaning that's produced, we see that, wow, this is, I just started thinking about this, how, you know, okay, well, here in my study, the, the, it just is the meanings seem so, you know, valuable. Um, they all shared how there were, you know, sent personal values that, that seemed, you know, supported and, you know, enlivened. And, you know, when, if the meaning response you know, from participants is, you know, produced from within themselves and is not, you know, not so directly kind of uh, written or, or co-created by, you know, a, a doctor who's saying, okay, you know, here's your dose, here's your diagnosis, you know, here's your regimen, come back to me in six months, um, then this is very powerful. Uh, I feel, you know, the meaning for them is powerful and is potentially healing because it's not, you um, it's not being told to them by a doctor or, or necessarily a DSM. It's coming from their own cultural and social and personal narratives. And, you know, some, so then the next step I, I thought that would be really interesting to look at would be, you know, what are those other, you know, cultural narratives? Um, Rob, you mentioned, you know, okay, well, why not bring in, you know, other, other, other uh, medicines, you know, Eastern, you know, Eastern approaches or indigenous approaches. And that would be, very interesting to see how, you know, if, how is this, how is the, the personal, you know, narrative and sense of meaning inform, say, if someone is microdosing and they also have a, you know, background in Ayurveda or background in, you know, Mestizo, you know, or, you know, Mazatec tradition, um, and how are these allowing them to, you know, access different um, parts of themselves beyond just, you know, biomedical, okay, my receptors are being stimulated, you know, let's go. Yeah, thank you for that, Sarah. Yeah, I mean, when you said in your presentation that you're almost, it was almost cliche where you were like, it was meaningful, you know, meaningful, like you didn't want to tell because like within our holistic alternative little bubble, <laughs> it's like so obvious. Um, but I don't think it can be underscored enough how potent it is when you actually look at the biomedical model and its power, right? And you look at the forces of colonization and capital that are behind them. Um, so just wanting to really affirm your, um, your underlining of that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate that too. And bringing in you, you bringing in, yeah, the dynamics of power and just how people are operating um, under and out from under that. Um, I don't have any uh, other questions. I think that was wonderful. So thank you. Okay, well, then um, this is a good moment. The audience can get involved and ask their own questions or, or comments that they have while the committee confers. And Stefan, if you could put us into a breakout room, sure. then we can uh, speak and we'll come back in a few minutes or so. Depends on okay. what we'll talk about and where we go. All right, okay. we'll see you soon. Thank you. Well, I have a comment. I think that was a wonderful presentation, Sarah. Thanks. And I think really, really important uh, for where we're at in the psychedelic uh, research and uh, industry space uh, in, the, in the, yeah, um, especially about meaning making. And I found that, uh, you know, as someone who works in the, I, I work in the psychedelic industry, and this is something that uh, often I find there's a thread that is 
the biomedical model is not ready or unprepared to uh, incorporate in a rushed fashion uh, psychedelic assisted therapies. And I think that anything we can do to kind of promote your research uh, on how, how important meaning making is can be valuable uh, for the industry as a whole. So uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that it was really informative and enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Sandeep. I have a question, Sarah. How do you how do you determine um, a full dose so that you know what the micro dose would be? I mean, is that height and weight, or how is a full dose determined? You 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 mean the full dose in, as opposed to a micro dose, or uh, the, yeah, the micro dose? Wouldn't you need to know the full dose to know what the micro dose is? Sure. I mean that that it's there. There's a range, uh, kind of an uh, and and it, there's especially a range, given that you know psilocybin, as I described, um, within even one strain, there's it can widely vary um, how much, sorry, how, how much psilocybin is actually within the 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 mushroom. So you know, good, I would say for someone who's curious, erring on the side of a very low, right? So if a kind of a low standard full dose would be two, you know, two grams, then, you know, going to, you know, 10% or 20, 20% 20 of that. Um, in general, the microdose range is about, you know, 0.1 to 0.5. I've actually seen it, you know, higher, it was actually higher in a couple of the placebo studies. And I just thought, well, that's, it was 0.7. I was like, well, that's, that's like, that's well above a microdose. But then when they actually did do a, a sort of a lab uh, analysis of the amount of psilocybin within the mushroom, and it and it was it was actually within the kind of the, the range of a of a microdose. So it's it, yeah, generally 0.1 to 0.5. I would say start absolutely with you know at the bottom 0.1 and go you know go up from there. So do you take into consideration the person's Height, weight. Um, yeah. You know, how do you how do you integrate the person and what their physiology and physical nature is with that particular amount? You know, with with the number. Yeah, sure. Uh, there, there is the, in 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 one line of thinking, uh, it, it one could one could incorporate both, um, you know, say, you, you know, um, gender assigned at birth uh, and uh, with um, weight and factor that into um, what the dose would be. It, it seems to be that what's more important is, um, is uh, kind of what's the intention, what's, what's the lifestyle like, you know, for example, June and the couple of my participants, I just thought it was really interesting that when their lifestyle changed and their stress, you know, essentially their stress level changed, that really was what impacted um, the dose. There's also, you know, more research needed to understand kind of how people metabolize differently. You know, people, I, I don't think it has to do, I don't, I don't know that it has to do anything with weight or, um, you know, a person's, a person's gender, it's, it's more, uh, there, there's very, there can be variation in how people metabolize, how quickly people metabolize. And so they're going to feel the effects differently. And then additionally, of course, um, you know, if people are on, uh, you know, psychotropic medication, you know, that's a, that's a whole nother discussion because, and it, well, you know, that, that can certainly affect the, 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 the microdose effect. So, Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. I just, I just have one thing to kind of dovetail on what Dana said. Um, also, if people are taking the microdose on an empty stomach or, you know, like a certain time of day, did, did that have a, you, I think you mentioned something about somebody saying that they took it with food and then it was, a better experience for them. 
Um, um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I actually had one participant and I, I've not, I've not really heard of this much, but the, but she, uh, Malia actually microdose right before bedtime and she would just microdose. And then she, she, she found that she would actually wake up and, you know, and, and feel kind of, uh, improvement of mood. And so, you know, obviously the dose that she was taking it, you know, it did not affect her sleep. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily, I think it's, it's more kind of how, what, what happens initially for a person when they microdose, do they feel a little bit, you know, cause it, the effects vary, maybe for some people it's energizing for other people it's relaxing. And so that's going to affect when a good time might be. I had another uh, person who, when their family was visiting, they still wanted to stay on their schedule. And so uh, they, they microdosed, they woke up at, at 5 a.m. and microdosed. And so the sort of the, the, the stronger effects were, had totally subsided by the time they were, you know, out and about and ready to say hi to their family and kind of, you know. Um, so uh, I would I would just say that it's 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 a personal it's a personal process and I think that's what's really neat about this this practice is that um, it can be tailored in so many in so many ways you know based on you know the person and what they're needing. How did you find the participants, Sarah? How did you encounter them for the study? I, yeah, I found the participants through uh, word of mouth and snowball sampling so you know essentially i i mean i put something out on on social media i shared what i was doing with coworkers, um shared what i was doing with friends and then it was mostly um word of mouth um and I, yeah I, or through uh you know colleagues mm -hmm. and was that the type of sample size that you were wanting and expecting or did it change you know just based on who was interested and available and met the screening criteria and so forth. It did not. Yeah, the I, I personally was wanting to go for a smaller sample size just to <laughs> be able to finish to to do a, an in depth, you know, study that didn't take me years and years. Mm -hmm. um, a couple things that I'll say about that. So I, I wanted to keep the sample size small. Um, looking back, I'm actually really glad that I did because I I could really, I could really let the stories li kind of live in me and just metabolize and percolate in a way that, you know, I, I don't know what, how, how it would have been if I had, you know, say 10 participants. Um, and I just, I was thinking the other day that I, you know, I loved, I loved, it was so meaningful to me, you know, all of the, what the participants shared. And I love that I got to spend, you know, such in some ways quality time with their, you know, their stories and, so I, for me, the, the num keeping the number um, low was, was uh, you know, in the end, great. And did you conduct the interviews, any of them in person or were they on the phone or what was that process? I conducted interviews. I conducted one in person, the rest of them online. And then I did follow up interviews. Feel like I did all of them but one on the phone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sarah, I'm hi. <laughs> hi, Kevin. Um, I'm curious um, if if you have any desire to continue doing some form of research in this area or some form of inquiry in this area moving forward. And if so, what that might look like or what you might focus on. Okay, thank you. I just, I just wanted to give a shout out to Kevin. He's a writing fellow or was, I don't know if you still are at the CIAS Writing Center. And he helped me so much with the, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I do want to answer your question, but I just, the funniest thing about this study is that I, a part of me chose narrative because I thought, oh, it'll be, you know, easy. I get to, you know, just write stories and, you know, da, da. and honestly, the writing the actual narratives for me personally was the hardest. It was so, it was so, I just couldn't get it. And I, it was just a cosmic joke because, you know, it's a ha ha ha, you, you know, see, see if you think, you know, this, this thing's going to be easy for the reason that you, you know, think. And, um, but Kevin 
was so patient and helpful in me reworking and reworking and reworking those narratives. So thank you, Kevin. Um, and uh, what I would say is at this time, the true answer is I have no idea. I feel that, I, you know, I was thinking about this and I, I certainly, I, I, at the moment, I, I certainly don't wanna initiate you know, initiate a kind of a, an, another research process. Um, if I was, you know, invited to, you know, join or hop on board, you know, a collaborative uh, research model, I would love that. You know, I, I think, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I love people and this is a very, the, the actual writing process, right? And conducting research as a sole researcher is a, that's a, it's a, you know, quite an endeavor to, to, to do as an individual. So I'm curious about collaboration. Yeah, and, and I don't know what that would, I mean, all of the things that I mentioned, you know, the implications, um, further areas of study, uh, you know, would be, would be interesting. So, yeah, um, I was, I, the one thing I was so curious about is looking at, you know, people understanding how people who have a, like a, a spiritual relationship with psilocybin, you know, just taking microdosing as a way to, you know, connect with that, connect, feel connected to that and facilitate that spiritual relationship. And that's something that didn't really come through very strongly. Um, but I'm so curious, you know, how, how people do that just to take a tiny little micro to just, you know, you know, bow and, and pray with the, the, the mushroom. <laughs> Hello, hello, we're back. Hi. So we concluded our uh, conversation and uh, here's the good news, Sarah. You passed this defense and we approve of your work. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. It's my honor and joy to be the first one to call you Dr. Willett. Thank you, Helge. Yay, Dr. Willett. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Willett. <laughs> Thank you, Congratulations. There are uh, two small uh, items that we would like you to change that you already um, heard about um, in the in the written feedback. Uh, one is in the lit review to have uh, maybe it can be a couple of paragraphs to a give an, uh, more of a nod to indigenous traditions that have been working uh, with psilocybin in particular and have sort of laid the footwork over the centuries uh, really um, and obviously you're not going into this in in depth but there that was one item that uh, we felt uh, still needs to be included uh, as well as uh, potentially another existing practices that using micro uh, medicinal like homeopathy in a in a way of what exists already in western healing traditions that might be different but also um, allude to certain facets of your study uh, and then on the on the conclusion part uh, you heard that already as well uh, to expand a little bit on your conclusive statements to situate your own study you know, kind of going back to where you started uh, to you know further linking what you found um, with where you started in your lit review uh, whether it's uh, you know the whole conversation on Foucault and power uh, or whether it's uh, other themes, we felt that could be strengthened a little bit further. Um, your own voice and your own place also in this uh, developing field on microdosing now that has developed while you were writing your study uh, to strengthen that whole section a little bit more. And those were the two, the two things we'd be asking for. Great, thank you. All right. Well, if we were in person at <laughs> CIS, this would be the time for hugs or to bring out a bottle of uh, champagne or fruit juice or something. Uh, congratulations again. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you so much, um, Rob, Helge, and Sam. Really appreciate your guidance and support. And to all of you who came, thank you.
Yes, and Rob had to bow out, uh, I think, for a different commitment as we're bumping up against the end of the time. But uh, if anybody else wants to say a few words, I know people wrote uh, on their chat any congratulations for Sarah or anything else that you would want to say, Sarah. We have a few more minutes. Start dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> Mimosas. <laughs> yeah. I'm just so glad to be here with you because I've seen you through different stages of the process. Yes. Um, and it's and to see it all come together at the end is is really beautiful. Yes. And there were um, surprising subtleties that that I wouldn't have expected in the beginning that that came out in your in your narrative analysis. Um, and I'm excited for whatever future research you do next. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you very much. What are you going to do to celebrate, Sarah? You know what's, you know what I've been thinking? I, I think that, okay, so it occurred to me that I had this dream the other earlier in the week where I was in a country that was not the United States. I don't know where it was. And I was off, I was exploring, I was exploring. And then I realized I got lost, you know, oh, I'm lost. And I had to figure out how to get back. And it reminded me about this favorite memory I have when I was five years old. And I went for a bike ride because we had just moved to a new neighborhood. And I just rode, 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 rode without a care in the world. And then I realized I was lost. So I had to, you know, um, re reach out to a stranger to find my way back. And this, this dissertation, while, you know, being lots of weaving uh, has, has had a focused end in, in sight and so I don't know what I'm going to do and I love saying I don't know I don't <laughs> have to know <laughs> so we will see what happens <laughs> she will be drinking a mimosa we're, I'm serious about the mimosas we're, we're doing the mimosas great <laughs> <I'll> somewhere <laughs> yeah, if we were all together we would go out for a drink now excellent I don't know where <laughs> civic center Great. Well, yeah. congratulations again, Sarah. I'm so happy for you. So happy for you. Um, what a what a long journey, and not only how you're going to celebrate, but you have your life back now, right? Uh, after, <laughs> after, I don't think anybody who hasn't uh, yet written a dissertation can appreciate really on on uh, what a big deal that is of yes. living with this entity for for years and. Uh, working on it and loving it and hating it and uh, all the rest in between yes. and uh, really really it, so happy to see where where you ended up uh, from when you first came into my office and I had just started as a core faculty yes. and you were talking about a study on microdosing and I was thinking to myself like <laughs> how is that gonna work um, but you know here we are and it worked out really well yeah. All right. Congratulations, Sarah. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, congratulations, Sarah. I know, you know, having had you in quite a few classes and, you know, you were over here and you were over here, you know, in terms of you were going deep into sacrificial longing and you had all these different plans. So, yeah. you know, to feel it come forward and, and you know, I think as Helge has said earlier too, how it went initially to where it is now, you know, the evolution and, you know, really applauding your um, determination, the heavyweight lifting, the heavyweight boxing sometimes as you're getting bludge bludgeoned in the head with your own edits and going back to it. <laughs> and I think there's, you know, for me, I remember there was a, some kind of sacrificial, you know, ceremony of burning all of these notes and dissertation papers it's like it's done it's published uh -huh. you know there's many rituals that can happen as a way yeah. to kind of cleanse out all that you've Absolutely. done yeah. I, I uh when i finished my master's thesis i was up on the second floor and i threw my desk out the second floor and and watched it crash and oh, oh my I, well oh, there you go <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know. Maybe, maybe this does. Of ritual. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, I'm saying goodbye to you all. And yes, I, take I'll good say care. goodbye as well. Thank you again, Sam. Thanks, yeah, thank everybody. You,
everyone. Robin, right. good to see Bye you, there. Kevin and Vanessa. Yeah. And Sarah, we'll, we'll connect in the next few days and Great. weeks Sounds until it's good. all okay. Thank tied you. up. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Hey, Sarah. Thanks, Stefan. Thank, thank you. Sure thing, Helen.